great. Well, yeah. Thank you so much, Jen and Ron, for inviting me to speak at this <laughs> webinar. Um, I wish it was in person, but uh, this is a, definitely a second best option. And uh, I really appreciate your leadership uh, in, in trying to shift us away from chemical pest control and to other forms. And so I will talk about integrated pest management so as, a, as a first start of that shift. Um, I'm a plant pathologist. Uh, I, I worked at Michigan State University as a small a grape and berry pathologist for 20 years and currently am director of the Cooperative Extension Office in Ventura County. So first I want to talk about pests. Pests are not just your little brother. There's you know, insects, uh, mites and spiders, um, plant diseases, plant pathogens, um, nematodes, weeds, vertebrates, and other unwanted species are considered pests. Uh, they're just a fact of life. There are a lot of other creatures who are vying for our food as well. And um, sometimes I think we should share a little bit more with them, but uh, definitely um, there are, uh, especially in a system that's unbalanced, there are especially is the chance for having invasive pests. Uh, nowadays with global agriculture, global shipping, we have um, uh, received a lot of pests that are coming in. and our crops may not be uh, resistant to those pests. So in general, uh, what is what IPM? I want to um, define that. Uh, it's an ecosystem-based strategy focusing on long-term prevention of pests or their damage and using multiple techniques such as biological control, habit manipulation, uh, cultural practices, and resistant varieties and normally using multiple techniques um, achieves more effective disease control or pest control than using a single technique. Um, and then selective pesticides are used only after monitoring indicates that they are needed to remove or reduce target organisms. So really they should be a method of last resort rather than the first thing that people grab uh, to, to control pests. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that for uh, uh, integrated disease management, uh, we use similar techniques. Um, uh, however, we don't usually use the term IDM. Uh, the term IPM is fairly well known. Um, even so, there's a lot more people who should know about IPM. So, uh, in, on the environment, on non-target species, uh, pesticide resistance was really an early driver for IPM in the 70s. We've had about 50 years of, of uh, integrated pest management. And I just want to go over quickly how pesticide uh, host, sorry, pesticide resistance develops. For instance, if you have mites um, on a leaf, um, many of them or some of them will already have a mutation. So I, I want to emphasize that the mutation already exists. And then when people start to spray pesticides to show that um, uh, these particular individuals that have a mutation and can resist the pesticide will be the ones to reproduce. And then the more sprays you apply, the more um, of the resistant individuals you'll have. And you just have this pest resurgence. And this was a, a big issue and when people realized that pesticides didn't work anymore and they realized they do need to uh, use other techniques to control pests. Um, so this is not, uh, not all pesticides uh, develop resistance or are prone to resistance development, only certain ones, especially pyrethroids and a lot of the systemic fungicides. So uh, when we talk about different pest management techniques, uh, very important will be pest monitoring. Uh, you need to have a correct pest or disease diagnosis. You first need to know what you have in your orchard um, or planting. Um, regular scouting is important. Know what to look for. Know what to look, what uh, stage of life stage you're looking for and when. Uh, for insects, you can use pheromones or other traps, which helps. Uh, for diseases, it's much more difficult because you can't see pathogens until you already have disease symptoms. Uh, but understanding the biology and life cycle of the pest or disease is, is pretty critical. Uh, again, knowing when the disease can develop and 
there are some pests and disease prediction models, especially for disease. It's important because like I said, you cannot see pathogens. Insects are hard to find as well, but at least, uh, you know, you can see them at least with a loop or something. Um, and then where possible, use pest or disease damage thresholds. So you don't just kill a pest or a pathogen um, when there's only a little bit. I know a lot of people, um, farmers might see insects and say, oh my God, I have to kill this. Um, there, you know, there are damage thresholds of, above a certain level when you could see damage and below that's probably not necessary to control them. Um, however, that is uh, needs a, a lot of research, and this is something that um, is not available for a number of pests and diseases, especially. Um, avoidance or prevention is another uh, important integrated pest management tool, uh, starting with healthy plant material that's virus tested, um, and many, in most cases, that is lab tested. You cannot just look at plants and know that they're infected by viruses. Sometimes you can, but it's not reliable. Uh, for annual crops, you can adjust the planting time to avoid, for instance, aphids that carry certain viruses. You have a crop-free period to break that life cycle. Uh, soil testing and treatment for nematodes and plant pathogens um, could be helpful in, in some diseases. For instance, the soybean cyst nematodes Farmers routinely send in soil samples to know what their levels are before they plant. And if they are too high, they won't plant in that particular field or they uh, apply some treatments. Uh, sanitation means removing diseased plant material, infest, you know, uh, insect in, uh, pupae and, and all that. And that's very uh, important. Uh, I added varietal resistance or host plant resistance here because in a way we're trying to avoid or prevent disease development. Um, again, uh, there, are not, there is not resistance for all diseases or insects. And sometimes if you have a plant that's resistant to one, it may be susceptible to another. So it's very difficult to find something that's resistant to all the pests and diseases in the area. Uh, barriers as well as netting can be uh, helpful for, to keep insects out, especially in, um, in greenhouses. Um, and for instance, for the spotted winter sofala uh, fruit fly, they have used netting to keep it out uh, of tunnels, etc. Um, I added reducing plant stress because uh, in some cases, stress plants are more susceptible to certain diseases and um, it's important to keep the plant happy and healthy to um, avoid certain disease and insects. And I added optimizing plant nutrition. I know we'll be hearing uh, about nutrition uh, later. And I think that's an area that is much, um, well, there hasn't been as much research, I think, as, as necessary to really show. And it's a difficult thing like um, to optimize plant nutrition, make sure that your plants uh, stay healthy, but it's definitely an area that needs more research. Um, environmental modification or habitat manipulation. Um, this is an additive method. I think it could be very important for some diseases and in insects. Uh, for instance, planting in an optimal location, a wind direction that allows a lot of airflow, which reduces humidity um, for disease development control. Uh, plant spacing and canopy management to reduce relative humidity. That's especially important, for instance, in grapes where uh, Botrytis bunch rot uh, is increased with high relative humidity. And so you have to to um, remove leaves, et cetera, to reduce that disease. Um, I added intercropping here because um, the more crops you have in a system, potentially the more beneficials, and also there's a, a bigger distance between the host plants that may be hard for pathogens or insects to bridge. So having multiple crops uh, tends to improve um, pest management. Um, mulches. Um, mulching obviously is important to uh, make sure that your plants aren't drought stressed, but they can also block certain pathogens or insects and uh, using reflective mulches, which is really a plastic, sometimes is, uh, can be repellent to certain insects. Um, improving drainage and avoiding over irrigation is important for root rot control, um, any kind of diseases, uh, pathogens that live in the soil that attack roots. And also reducing insect overwintering sites where that's uh, possible um, can be a method of environmental modification.
So biological control, uh, now Ron and, and Jen are, are experts at that and uh, Ventura County has had an illustrious history of biocontrol, especially in yeah. cities. Um, I was surprised to find out that um, I thought biocontrol was something that happened since the 60s and 70s to find out that Ventura County has had at least uh, almost 100 years of biocontrol. Um, this is the application of beneficial insects and microbes to control uh, pests and diseases. Um, we can also use soil amendments to stimulate native beneficial microbes. For instance, um, a technique called anaerobic soil disinvestation is used in strawberries to control soilborne diseases by adding rice bran to the soil uh, under anaerobic conditions um, by covering the soil up. That um, ends up stimulating uh, bacteria in the soil that end up killing pathogens. Um, there are certain trap crops against nematodes, for instance, crops that will stimulate the uh, germination of the um, uh, uh, eggs to, to germinate and young nematodes will then try to feed on the roots, but they, those crops may not support those nematodes and thereby you end up killing uh, those nematodes. And I added pigs and chickens here because they can actually be very effective. For instance, in, uh, we had a case in apples of plum curculio. Uh, and so a lot of the apples that the drops that fell to the ground were eaten by pigs and they reduced insect pressure tremendously. And I think chickens also can be helpful um, if they don't eat your fruit um, to actually reduce uh, pests in certain orchards and situations. Uh, the two pictures shown here obviously are some of the most well-known um, biocontrol agents, the, the lady beetle eating aphids and, and also a, a parasitic wasp in, um, laying an egg in a, a um, caterpillar. So Ron asked me to also talk a little bit about uh, fungi in the soil and since I'm a mycologist, uh, I, I definitely, I love fungi so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about those. Um, the main roles of fungi in soil are uh, decomposers. For instance, um, the pretty mushrooms here, they decompose organic matter. They play an important role in the soil food web. And in, uh, in the nutrient cycling um, in soil, they also improve soil structure. And fungi have, you know, um, mycelium or hyphae, which are threads that grow through the soil and they can also improve, uh, bind together soil particles and organic matter to improve soil structure. Um, the other ones are what I call symbionts or that, that live together with plants like mycorrhizae. And there's a picture here showing mycorrhizal hyphae um, extending from a root. And these are actually very important. Many crops have mycorrhizae. Um, the fungi serve to um, extract nutrients from the soil, especially phosphorus and nitrogen, depending on the fungus and the host crop, the host plant. Uh, they play a role in nutrient acquisition, in uh, water, sort of uh, increase uh, drought, um, reduce drought stress in plants. They can also have a protective function as they uh, prevent roots from being attacked by pathogens. So mycorrhizae are very very um, interesting. Um, they're usually already present. Sometimes it's hard to show what, what they do, uh, you know, what benefit they give to the plants, but they definitely have benefits and how to encourage that. Um, one of the studies I did in blueberries, or organic blueberries, we definitely found more mycorrhizae in organic blueberries than conventional blueberries. And whether that was because they had less nitrogen application or um, whether the conditions were just uh, right um, they, they do play an important role. Obviously, there's also pathogens in the soil. Those are not beneficial to plants. Um, and this is a, a, a Phytophthora spore or sporangium, um, and those cause root rots. And so having a balance, the more, I think, beneficial fungi or other fungi you have, the more diversity, the harder it is for pathogens to survive and attack plants. I also want to focus a little bit on predatory and parasitic fungi that also live in the soil. Uh, for instance, here you have a fungus that is a nematode trapping fungus. Um, and also I want to mention uh, there's plant pathogenic nematodes, but there's also a lot of beneficial 
nematodes that are playing part in the nutrient cycling in the soil, very important role. But here you see a fungus that has trapped a nematode will eventually grow into the nematode and eat it up. Um, here you see a, a, a Colorado potato beetle that's been attacked by a fungus, a Bovaria baseata probably, and here an ant that's been attacked by cordyceps, which is, it's also called a zombie, a zombie uh, fungus or zombie disease. And so here you see fruiting bodies of the fungus coming out of the ant. It's actually pretty hideous. And then there are fungi that attack the beneficial fungi as well. So there's very interesting and intricate life cycles and connections with uh, all the microbes in the soil that we're just starting to learn about and how to harness them to help us control pests and diseases. I want to, uh, I don't know if you can see this. Yes, um, here we have some biocontrol agents uh, that, I, that have actually been commercialized and I know we'll hear more uh, about biocontrol agents from Pam Marone and other speakers, but I just want to mention that Trichoderma hartzianum is a soil fungus that uh, is growing green on a plate here that is one of the earliest soil fungi that was shown to uh, prevent diseases like root rots uh, in the soil and attack other pathogens. And so it's, uh, for instance, sold as root shield is one of the, the products made with trichoderma. That's a very strong soil uh, fungus. And um, many of these fungi produce extracellular enzymes that um, also help to break down uh, pathogenic fungi. Another one is this Bovaria bassiana, which is an insect of, uh, pathogenic fungus. So uh, again, this has been commercialized. One of the products is Botanic Guard, but there are others. And it is sprayed against insects like white flies, thrips, aphids, psyllids, mealybugs, beetles, plant bugs, and weevils. Uh, one of the things I really want to emphasize is that these uh, beneficial fungi work best in humid conditions. And so it's difficult in a climate like here where it's hot and dry during the growing season to get an effect with some of these fungi, especially Bovaria. You really need humidity um, and, and just moist conditions to help. And so one of the things I wanna look at, and I, I also started working on this in Michigan, is using these fungi to control the pathogen during the, the, the winter or the pests uh, during the winter when the fungus maybe is able to proliferate and, and attack overwintering stages of insects and diseases, but we'll have more time uh, because you don't see uh, as quickly of an effect during the growing season. One of the, my belief is that, you know, all answers are to be found in nature and that biodiversity is key both biodiversity in the soil, in the, in the landscape. Um, you know, I think we need to think really much more uh, in terms of polycultures and not monocultures. Um, and so biodiversity at all levels, including on the plant surface and in the soil. I do wanna mention chemical control because this is still considered part of, of IPM, but it should be the method of last resort. And I think we need to really switch more to uh, looking at chemical control that way. Unfortunately, it's like, you know, it's like a drug, it's easy. You see an effect quite uh, right rapidly. It's you know, not as expensive in many cases. Um, and I, I did put a picture of a, um, of a spray rig here that is actually a recycling sprayer that um, can be used um, to reduce drift and also to recycle uh, pesticides so that you use less of a pesticide. And there are many pesticides available, uh, for instance, especially for, for uh, diseases as well as insects that are soft or, or based on natural products. But anyway, um, uh, should you use, one, uh, use pesticide, it has to be really done after monitoring indicates a need. And uh, the goal, sorry for the misspelling here, is to reduce pest organisms below the economic threshold. And I mention economic here because um, if, you know, you spray a pesticide to, to save $50 an acre of damage, but your pesticide costs um, $70 an acre, you really haven't 
you know, gain anything. So um, the other important thing is properly calibrating equipment. Uh, there's a lot of um, issues with equipment that are, is not well calibrated, um, but you need to really adjust nozzles and, and to provide effective coverage at the lowest effective dose. There are also some ways in using pesticides as in attract and kill traps um, that has been used to trap insects away um, while only having maybe the, the pesticide in a trap and not on the crop. And very importantly, as we are starting to learn more about effects of pesticides on pollinators and the negative, the, the loss of pollinators, we should spray at times when pollinators are not active um, and, and using pesticides that are uh, not harmful to pollinators, but um, this is definitely a, a big, big issue. So I do want to mention uh, the uh, Huanglong Bing and the Asian citrus psyllids. Um, as we are experiencing now with the coronavirus, there are actually many <laughs> multiple uh, issue pests or pathogens coming out of China. This is one of them. Um, and as you can see here, it really has spread all over the world um, most, to most citrus areas, has devastated the citrus industry in, in uh, Florida, and is now moving uh, through California. So I did want to uh, mention that Chinese growers have pioneered the prevention strategy uh, in China. It has been spreading, and I think the citrus industry is, is farther north now than it used to be. Uh, but they are managing Wang Long Bing there with a three-pronged approach, which is planting bacteria-free saplings, which is uh, starting with healthy plant material, uh, removing infected trees, and monitoring and suppressing psyllids. And unfortunately, that is, is done with pesticide applications, especially area-wide. And uh, so that's one way that they can keep um, in production. Um, there We'll hear more, I'm sure, about uh, biocontrol, but there is a, 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 a little um, parasitic wasp, Demerixia radiata, um, that will lay uh, eggs in nymphs. Um, however, they, they can, they reduce populations, but they certainly won't reduce them to, to zero. If they do, then of course they're out of a food source. And so the problem with, um, uh, the bacterium that causes Wang Long Bing and the insects being very efficient, like it only takes really one insect to, an infected insect um, to start or infect a, a tree, uh, that, you know, keeping the population below a level where they are not going to spread the disease is very difficult with biocontrol. Um, but uh, we definitely, there are more ways in which we uh, what we need to look at for controlling uh, this disease. There are um, other cultural methods. There are, you know, barriers where there's many more things that we need to look at that can be supporting each other um, to control this, this very devastating disease. So I want to, as I... Um, finalize my talk, I want to mention the Roadmap for Integrated Pest Management. That was a, a publication that I'm sure if we were together, you would uh, be able to get a copy, but it's also available online. Um, that was developed by uh, the University of California Statewide IPM program, which has, was established in 1980. Um, and so by Lori Berger, James Farrar, uh, Peter Kuldell, and Joseph McIntyre, in 2018, and they looked at, you know, where, what are the societal issues? Why isn't IPM more, um, you know, more common or adopted? What are the barriers? And so I just want to share briefly what, um, you know, some of the things that they found and, and why IPM is not more adopted. Because we really want to move towards more integrated pest management and to lower chemical usage. And so, uh, for instance, um, IPM is, these are drivers that would actually promote IPM is market demand. As when people are more aware of, of IPM, they will want to demand uh, like organic um, uh, crops that are grown with those techniques. 
proof of efficacy very important. We need data to convince growers that when they use these methods, they are going to get disease control or insect control. Uh, third party requirements for IPM uh, and uh, supermarkets or buyers can demand uh, IPM techniques. For instance, when I was working with the Welch's, um, the, the grape growers growing juice grapes for Welch's grape juice, uh, they, uh, they required uh, IPM techniques and not certain fungicides not be used uh, and insecticides. Um, resistance management, um, definitely for for the promotion uh, for the to to stop resistance pesticide resistance from developing in in insects and diseases um, that is a big driver for IPM the availability of soft active, uh, active ingredients or so soft pesticides again we just need a lot more data I found with uh, I've tested biocontrol agents and natural products for 20 years and uh, many of them were run by small companies, and it was just very difficult to get good efficacy data. Um, risk reduction, uh, certainly for for protect, work protection, uh, the capacity to manage pests and pesticides holistically, and also um, tolerance to pest pressure. So some people definitely will be more tolerant of certain pests than others. Then there are other issues that are actually restraining uh, or limiting the IPM adoption, which is the cost of potential loss, so the sense of risk, uh, external requirements, especially for instance, um, when you um, export uh, products, there are a lot of requirements for uh, you know, absence of pests and diseases, and so that's maybe a very high demands there as well as people, uh, consumers having very high demands for what their produce looks like. Uh, the surety of control, the simplicity of the treatments, the cost of management. Uh, many of the IPM techniques may cost more and require more education, more training as well. We also need trained IPM advisors. We don't, uh, we need more than people, you know, just scouting and recommending pesticides. We need people who can actually recommend IPM techniques. Um, the influence of the crop protection industry um, mm -hmm. and just familiarity. I think uh, a lot of growers do what they that they know works, and so uh, being more familiar with other methods um, and know that they work and have confidence. I think confidence is a part of this, and this also comes to peer pressure when. You know, somebody finds out, oh, you're spraying for, for this pest now, and maybe I should also do that. And just the demand for perfect fruit, and I think a lot of consumer education has to go into that. So there are a lot of factors, um, and, you know, I'm from the Netherlands. Our government sometimes will say, well, you can't spray that anymore. You can't use that, and we have to move this way, and we have, I think, more government uh, influence in what growers get to do or not do and to have much more a push towards IPM uh, from above. So in this uh, publication, they have recommendations for strengthening IPM, which one of the very important one is to reinvest in, a, in IPM at every level and leverage non-traditional resources. Uh, here at the office, we have, uh, we lack an entomologist, which is really critical and we don't um, have funding through University of California Ag and Natural Resources to hire an advisor or researcher in entomology. So we have to probably, the Thelma Hansen Fund will help us um, hire somebody or look for other funding. But this is a very limiting factor. It does not have enough people to do the research and the extension. Uh, we need to speed up the IPM innovation process uh, invest in trusted messengers and make practitioners more effective voices for IPM, uh, as well as driving the demand on the consumer side for IPM in the value chain and strengthening the public's capacity to understand pests, pesticides and IPM. I think there's such a lack of understanding uh, in, in the general public about um, the pests, especially invasives that are coming through. Uh, growers have to battle um, a lot of um, a lot of problems. 
in addition to water and, and uh, climate change, etc. And climate change may, uh, you know, advance some of these um, pests as well. Uh, we need to increase collaborative and problem solving capacities of stakeholders, practitioners and policymakers, and also to strengthen the capacity of practitioners, meaning growers to use more IPM. They also mentioned redesigning the retail IPM process. Anyway, there's a lot of details uh, uh, regarding these particular recommendations in the, in the publication and I recommend you read it if you have, now that we have maybe more time being uh, working from home. And um, I intend to uh, follow up where I can on these recommendations because I think we need to shift, shift way more away from chemicals um, for pest and disease control in, in Ventura County and, and California. So uh, here, I don't know if there's time for questions, but I'll be happy to answer some questions. Thank you so much, Anamik. And yeah, uh, do you see some questions in the chat, Brett, that you'd like to bring up? Or I imagine that Greg might have some comment um, from the panel. And Jim, Jim as well. Um, let me unmute you, Greg. I just muted myself. Okay. No, that's great information, and and gets us off to a good start here with the general principles. Right. Yeah. No. No burning questions at the moment. Okay. <laughs> Can you so have the, the quiz question then for this test question. Oh right, I have a poll. Um, stop share, by the way. Or so oh, that that's a lovely picture of the. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well you're welcome to yeah. Yeah. put the question over that. Sure. So this. Oh, we have one question that just came up. Okay. Egan, uh, so uh, what do you think the biggest challenge is in getting conventional farmers interested in IPM? Um, I, I think the biggest challenge personally is his data and having, you know, viable options for disease control and, and just um, it, it's also related to risk or a sense of risk. how much risk are they um, running and if you have products that you know will work that are maybe a little more expensive or um, you know and it, it just also requires training and knowledge to how to use these methods effectively so I think knowledge and, and data would be my estimates of what's uh, most of the limiting factor. Mm -hmm. And then one more question that just came in uh, do you have a counterpart IPM uh, are there counterpart IPM advocates at other extensions throughout California? Um, you mean like farm advisors? Yeah, I guess, or, or people in similar positions in other extension offices uh, throughout the state? Yeah, there are. And it, it's, uh, we have the statewide IPM program that supports uh, a number of advisors in different counties. Um, it, it varies. We have for Ventura County an IPM advisor who's based in San Luis Obispo, covers multiple counties. And that is uh, the other issue with the reduced funding that ANR has um, received over the years uh, is that we have, we have people in name, but they are really, when you spread over three counties, uh, it's very hard to accomplish that much. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really, um, but we have people throughout the state who are maybe specialists in different crops, cropping systems uh, that focus on IPM and biocontrol. And we try to use each other's expertise um, to answer problems or questions in our, in our counties. We also have specialists, by the way, at the universities working on different uh, issues. Mm -hmm. And one, one more just came in. It says, uh, if the orchard has a grassland cover crop, is that bacterially driven? Um, and is there a way to promote fungal benefits without extensive mulching? Um, so a grass, 
a grass cover crop. Yeah. What is that? Um, yeah, my what I've read is that uh, uh, bacteria may be more numerous uh, in, in grasslands than, than fungi. Um, and bacteria are good too. They, they're just, I think they cycle more rapidly. They, their life cycle is much more quick. Um, and so that you might maybe lose more nitrogen that way. But, um, you know, as far as, as I think a lot of people tend to emphasize fungi as being important, I think uh, mulch is, yeah, would definitely increase fungal, um, fungal predominance. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you can really enhance it. You can make a, a fungally dominant compost tea. I have a customer who's doing that and, and put it through your irrigation system. You can also make fungally dominant compost. But probably for the answer he asked, uh, probably a, an inoculant that would go through the irrigation system would be something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm sure there'll be a lot of interesting uh, information coming from the next uh, speakers about that. Mm -hmm. oh, thanks. I have a question, Annemiek. Uh, yes. Do you, um, how do you think that we could best influence the UC system to do research on alternative uh, methods like the ones we're discussing today when, you know, the companies generally are small and don't have a lot of money to spend on uh, research uh, uh, grants for the university um, as compared to chemical companies and other people that have a, you know, have a, a large budget and can easily afford that kind of research? Um, what kind of arguments can we make that, and who are the um, people we should be making them to within the UC? Um, well, you, you, I think the important thing is to have people who are interested um, and work with them to try and get, uh, get other types of funding, like from the Western SARE, uh, UCA funding, um, and to have, I think, more partnerships and, and definitely um, asking for that information. Um, I, yeah, your point about the small companies that are especially running biocontrol or producing biocontrol agents not having enough funding to do widespread testing. Um, I, I did a lot of testing through the IR4 project and got funding for that for some of these products. One of the things that was interesting to me is that some of the, you know, the big companies, Bayer, BSF, they are now also um, having their own lines of biocontrol agents. Um, so there is more testing, but I, I think um, keep asking, um, you know, funding is, is the big issue, I think, uh, and having, I think we, we need to have maybe teams of people working together to evaluate these products. Um, but yeah, it does cost money and that's, I think, one of the limiting factors. So we have to look for alternative um, resources funding sources. Right, I'm gonna um, so much. Should I stop share? Yeah, oh, there we go. So, um, everybody, I am having a hard time figuring out how to run the poll for the quiz. So we're gonna do the pop quiz for Animex presentation after the next presentation. What do you think? Um, uh, was it, this is a, a great segue into what we're going to hear from Greg Young.